Book Seven, Part Two of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anabasis by Xenophon, translated by H. G. Dawkins. Book Seven, Part Two. Now these five were left: Neon the Essenian, Phrynescus the Achaean, Felicius the Achaean, Xanthocles the Achaean. Timetian the Dardanian, at the head of the army, and they pushed on to some villages of the Thracians facing Byzantium, and there encamped. Now the generals could not agree. Cleonor and Phrynescus wished to march to join Sethus, who had worked up their feelings by presenting one with a horse and the other with a woman to wife. But Neon's object was to come to the Chersonese. When we are under the wing of the Lacedaemonians, he thought, I shall step to the front and command the whole army. Timatian's one ambition was to cross back again into Asia, hoping to be reinstated at home and end his exile. The soldiers shared the wishes of the last general. But as time dragged on, many of the men sold their arms at different places and set sail as best they could. Others actually gave away their arms, some here, some there, and became absorbed in the cities. One man rejoiced. This was Anixabeus, to whom the break up of the army was a blessing. That is the way, he said to himself, I can best gratify Pharnabasus. But Anixabeus, while prosecuting his voyage from Byzantium, was met at Cyzicus by Aristarchus, the new governor, who was to succeed Cleander at Byzantium. And report said that a new admiral, Paulus, if he had not actually arrived, would presently reach the Hellespont and relieve Anixabeus. The latter sent a parting injunction to Aristarchus to be sure and sell all the Syrian soldiers he could lay hands on, still lingering in Byzantium, for Cleander had not sold a single man of them. On the contrary, he had made it his business to tend to the sick and wounded, pitying them, and insisting on their being received in the houses. Aristarchus changed all that, and was no sooner arrived in Byzantium than he sold no less than four hundred of them. Meanwhile, Anixabeus, on his coasting voyage, reached Parium, and according to the terms of their agreement, he sent to Pharnabazus. But the latter, learning that Aristarchus was the new governor at Byzantium, and that Anixabeus had ceased to be admiral, turned upon him a cold shoulder, and set out concocting the same measures concerning the Syrian army with Aristarchus, as he had been lately at work upon with Anixabeus. Anixabeus thereupon summoned Xenophon and bade him, by every manner of means, sail to the army with the utmost speed, and keep it together. He was to collect the scattered fragments and march them down to Perinthus, and thence convey them across to Asia without loss of time. And herewith he put a thirty-oared galley at his service, and gave him a letter of authority and an officer to accompany him, with an order to the Perinthians to escort Xenophon without delay on horseback to the army. So it was that Xenophon sailed across and eventually reached the army. The soldiers gave him a joyous welcome and would have been only too glad to cross from Thrace into Asia under his leadership. But Suthus, hearing that Xenophon had arrived, sent Metosades again by sea to meet him, and begged him to bring the army to him, and whatever he thought would make his speech persuasive, he was ready to promise him. But the other replied that none of these things were open to him to do, and with this answer Metosades departed, and the Hellenes proceeded to Perinthus. Here, on arrival, Neon withdrew his troops and encamped apart, having about eight hundred men, while the remainder of the army lay in one place under the walls of Perinthus. After this, Xenophon set himself to find vessels, so as to lose no time in crossing. But in the interval Aristarchus, the governor from Byzantium, arrived with a couple of warships, being moved to do so by Pharnabasis. To make doubly sure, he first forbade the skippers and shipmasters to carry the troops across, and then he visited the camp and informed the soldiers that their passage into Asia was forbidden. Xenophon replied that he was acting under the orders of Anexabeus, who had sent him thither for this express purpose, to which Aristarchus retorted, For the matter of that, Anexabeus is no longer admiral, and I am governor in this quarter. If I catch any of you at sea, I will sink you. With these remarks he retired within the walls of Perinthus. Next day he sent for the generals and officers of the army. They had already reached the fortification walls, 
when some one brought word to Xenophon that if he set foot inside he would be seized, and either meet some ill fate there, or more likely be delivered up to Pharnabasis. On hearing this, Xenophon set forward the rest of the party, but for himself pleaded that there was a sacrifice which he wished to offer. In this way he contrived to turn back and consult the victims. Would the gods allow him to try and bring the army over to Suthis? On the one hand, it was plain that the idea of crossing over to Asia in the face of this man with his ships of war, who meant to bar the passage, was too dangerous. Nor did he altogether like the notion of being blocked up in the Chersonese with an army in dire need of everything, where, besides being at the beck and call of the governor of the place, they would be debarred from the necessaries of life. While Xenophon was thus employed, the generals and officers came back with a message from Aristarchus, who had told him they might retire for the present, but in the afternoon he would expect them. The former suspicions of a plot had now ripened to a certainty. Xenophon, meantime, had ascertained that the victims were favourable to his project. He personally, and the army as a whole, might with safety proceed to Suthis, as they seemed to say. Accordingly, he took with him Polycrates, the Athenian captain, and from each of the generals, not including Neon, some one man whom they could in each case trust, and in the night they set off to visit the army of Suthis, sixty furlongs distant. As they approached, they came upon some deserted watch-fires, and their first impression was that Suthis had shifted his position, but presently perceiving a confused sound, the voices of Suthis's people signalling to one another, the explanation dawned on him. Suthis kept his watch-fires kindled in front of, instead of behind, his night pickets, in order that the outposts, being in the dark, might escape notice, their numbers and position thus being a mystery, whilst any party approaching from the outside, so far from escaping notice, would, through the glare of the fire, stand out conspicuously. Perceiving how matters stood, Xenophon sent forward his interpreter, who was one of the party, and bade him inform Sethus that Xenophon was there and craved conference with him. The others asked if he were an Athenian from the army yonder, and no sooner had the interpreter replied, Yes, the same, than up they leapt and galloped off. And in less time than it takes to tell, a couple of hundred peltasts had come up, who seized and carried off Xenophon, and those with him, and brought them to Suthis. The latter was in a tower right well guarded, and there were horses round it in a circle, standing already bitted and bridled, for his alarm was so great that he gave his horses their provender during the day, and during the nights he kept watch and ward with the brutes thus bitted and bridled. It was stated in explanation that in old days an ancestor of his, named Teres, had been in this very country with a large army, several of whom he had lost at the hands of the native inhabitants, besides being robbed of his baggage train. The inhabitants of the country are Thinians, and they are reputed to be by far the most warlike set of fighters, especially at night. When they drew near, Suthus bade Xenophon enter, and bring with him any two he might choose. As soon as they were inside, they first greeted one another warmly, and then, according to the Thracian custom, pledged themselves in bowls of wine. There was further present at the elbow of Suthus, Metosades, who on all occasions acted as his ambassador-in-chief. Xenophon took the initiative and spoke as follows. You have sent to me, Suthus, once and again. On the first occasion, you sent Metosades yonder to Chalcedon, and you begged me to use my influence in favour of the army crossing over from Asia. You promised me in return, for this conduct on my part, various kindnesses. At least that is what Metosades stated. And before proceeding further he turned to Metosades and asked, Is that not so? The other assented. Again, on a second occasion, the same Metosades came when I had crossed over from Perium to rejoin the army, and he promised me that if I would bring you the army, you would in various respects treat me as a friend and brother. He said especially with regard to certain seaboard places, of which you are the owner and lord, that you were minded to make me a present of them. At this point he again questioned Metosades, whether the words attributed to him were exact, and Metosades once more fully assented. Come now, proceeded Xenophon, recount what answer I made you, at first at Chalcedon. You answered that the army was, in any case, about to cross over to Byzantium, and as far as that went, there was no need to pay you or any one else anything, and for yourself you added, that once across you were minded to leave the army, which thing came to pass, even as you said. 
"'Well, what did I say,' he asked, "'at your next visit, when you came to me at Salibria? "'You said that the proposal was impossible. "'You were all going to Perinthus to cross into Asia.' "'Good,' said Xenophon. "'And in spite of it all, at the present moment, here I am myself, "'and Phrynicus, one of my colleagues, and Polycrates yonder, a captain, "'and outside, to represent the other generals, all except Neon the Laconian, the trustiest men they could find to send, so that, if you wish to give these transactions the seal of still greater security, you have nothing to do but to summon them also. And do you, Polycrates, go and say from me that I bid them leave their arms outside, and you can leave your own sword outside before you enter with them on your return. When Suthis had heard so far, he interposed, I should never mistrust an Athenian, for we are relatives already, I know, and the best of friends I believe we shall be. After that, as soon as the right men entered, Xenophon first questioned Suthis as to what use he intended to make of the army, and he replied as follows. Mycetes was my father. His sway extended over the Militade, the Thinians, and the Tranipse. Then the affairs of the Orissians took a bad turn, and my father was driven out of this country, and later on died himself of sickness, leaving me to be brought up as an orphan at the court of Medicus, the present king. But I, when I had grown to a man's estate, could not endure to live with my eyes fixed on another's board. So I seated myself on the seat by him as a suppliant, and begged him to give me as many men as he could spare, that I might wreak what mischief I could on those who had driven us forth from our land, that thus I might cease to live in dependence upon another's board, like a dog watching his master's hand. In answer to my petition, he gave me the men and the horses which you will see at break of day, and nowadays I live with these, pillaging my own ancestral land. But if you would join me, I think, with the help of heaven, we might easily recover my empire. That is what I want of you. Well, then, said Xenophon, supposing we came, what should you be able to give us? The soldiers, the officers, and the generals. Tell us that these witnesses may report your answer." and he promised to give to the common soldiers a cizazine, to a captain twice as much, and to a general four times as much, with as much land as ever they liked, some yoke of oxen, and a fortified place upon the seaboard. But now, supposing, said Xenophon, we fail of success, in spite of our endeavours, suppose any intimidation on the part of the Lacedaemonians should arise, will you receive into your country any of us who may seek to find a refuge with you? He answered, Nay, not only so, but I shall look upon you as my brothers, entitled to share my seat, and the joint possessors of all the wealth which we may be able to acquire. And to you yourself, O Xenophon, I will give you my daughter, and if you have a daughter I will buy her in Thracian fashion, and I will give you Bysanth as a dwelling-place, which is the fairest of all my possessions on the seaboard. End of Book 7, Part 2